And there are things that I want us to be reminded of, especially going into the holidays, because, you know, holidays are horrible for our community. And we need to be armed and ready with things to be able to bounce back and say when they say negative things, even when we sometimes say negative things, we need to be able to say what the Word of God says about what they're saying. First off, for instance, like when we say this is just impossible, and I don't know how many times I've heard that this week from people. I'm in an impossible situation. I have an impossible relationship. I have and they just begin to say how horrible it is. Well, this is what God says. God says what? All things are possible. We have to be able to turn around what our minds might try to get us to say. We talked last week about what we say is important and what we say creates an image, and that image is what we live by or succumb to. But here's the scripture that goes along with this one. This is what Luke 18, 27 says. Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. So when somebody tells you that this is just an impossible situation, I cannot get out of it, you need to remind yourself, that's not what the Bible says. And we need to be quick to give them not what, what we think, what we feel. We need to be able to be come back quick with what does God say. The scripture is the only thing that we know that will stand forever. Our words won't, but the word of God will stand forever. So we need to take them home, drive them right back to the fact that, you know what? We've got a, a tool that sees us through. Sometimes we fail to use it. You know, it's like, you know, you have a jar that doesn't come undone. Jeff was trying to get a thing of salsa open the other day, and he was turning, and he was turning, and he's turning, and he's turning. And I said, Jeff, I went, and and tapped it on the counter, it's just open like that. And he said, how did you learn to do that? I said, my grandmother taught me how to do that. My grandmother taught me how to do that. Things that we don't use very often, we fail to have a quick handle on. These scriptures are things that we need to have a quick comeback with. When people have a problem, when they make starting to make statements that we know they will regret, we know that they're really not true. These are the things, like when it's impossible. Uh, I don't, you know, I may feel like this sometimes. When I say, I'm just too tired, I'm just too tired, I don't want to do that, I'm just too tired. You know, God will say, I will give you rest. Uh, I was t telling some of the folks here this morning, this is going to be a really long day for me and a really quick and early tomorrow and a long week. And I can't afford to say, I'm tired. I've got to remind myself that when I get to bed tonight, the Bible says that he gives his beloved sleep. But that's not the scripture. This is out of Matthew 11. It says, come to me, all you who are heavy burdened, heavy, weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I believe that when God provides for us a livelihood, a living, whatever it is that we all do, there comes points in times where we get tired of doing it. I don't know about anybody, but I get occasionally tired of doing it. I have to remind myself that, you know what, that is a joy in the fact that that is God providing for me. I have, to, I have to think and change my thinking about it and say, you know what, this is God providing for me. Getting on that plane, God's providing for me. I don't have to pay for that. I don't have to worry about that ticket. God's providing for me. It's all being provided for me. Uh, over here, when nobody says, nobody really loves me, nobody cares for me, nobody loves me, God says what? I love you. And here in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So, you know, when people say, you know, they get their attitudes all out of whack, you know, and a lot of times, I, I don't know about you, but I hear this from people in the gay community that, you know, they've been run off by their family, they're, 
not appreciated by their kids. I, I, had, I told you last week that Spice was in town, and Spice and I had a very, very wonderful conversation about her siblings. Because she said, well, Dad, three out of four of you, three out of four of us love you. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't think I need to know which one the one isn't. And she said, no one just has a lesser appreciation for you than the rest of us. And I said, well, that's a good way to put that. Because it would be very easy to obsess with the one instead of rejoicing in the other three. It would be. And in our relationships, people get out there and they, you know, I've just got to get my manager to like me. I've just got to get my manager. When everybody else likes you, don't be obsessed because there is one that loves you with an undying love, an undying love. Here's another one that goes along with that. John 13, 34, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Just realize, you know what? It's the old, you know, we call it karma. We call it the biblical statement and the fact that given it shall be, what? Given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together. This is what it's about. You know, do people give that same love that they're looking for? Do they give that same concern that they're looking for? And either the answer is yes or the answer is no. And we got to remind ourselves and remind others, what are you doing? Don't be the big black hole that just sucks in everything on the inside. Be someone that gives and loves other people and loves them instead. So when people say, I just don't feel loved, I just don't feel needed, I don't, well, just remind them, God paid a big price to love you. Remind yourself that. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've heard people say, I just can't go on anymore. I just can't go on. <sighs> I think about, oh, Scarlet, I just can't go on any further. Shut up and go on. God says, my grace is sufficient. <laughs> my grace is sufficient for you. you know, shut up and go on. That's right. You know, that's, that would be another statement my grandmother would say, just shut up. <laughs> if you can't say something nice, shut up. Yeah, it goes back to that. So the scripture here in 2 Corinthians says, but he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast and all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. May rest on me. Here's another one out of Proverbs. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver and honor him. You know, I like the fact that God says, I will deliver you. I don't care what the situation is, whether it be, you know, people out of money, people out of jobs, people out of love, people out of relationship, people, whatever your void is, God says, I am more than enough for you. More than enough. More than enough. The problem with it is people just don't look to him. They start looking at the negative because our world certainly could get hung up on that. I just can't figure things out. I just, I, I don't have, I, I don't know what's wrong. I don't know how to figure it all out. You know, I don't know about you, but if there were one here out of these 15, this would be the one that I would be. I just can't figure, I can't figure people out sometimes. Just can't figure it out. And God says, you know what? Don't worry about that. I'll direct your steps. My steps are the important ones. I can't hold anybody else responsible for, for, for mine. Only I can. That's my job. My job. So the scripture that goes with this, when they say, I just can't figure things out, this is the one over here in Proverbs. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make their path straight. No, your path, your path straight. See, I learned a long time ago, I guess it was my in-laws that really kind of taught me this. They were coming out with a book. This is many, many years ago. This is back in probably mid-70s, long time ago. My in-laws were very prolific writers. They wrote during their lifetime in excess of 80 books. 
and all of them were, all of them except for maybe a handful, were all great sellers, were very prominent books. And we had prayed, they were at our house, we had prayed that year, because we were, I was opening up their publishing house, and I said, we're gonna pray and we're gonna believe this year for the number one best-selling Christian book to come out of this group of people. There were four of us. And my mother-in-law says, we're only working on one book. And I said, I know. I said, I know. She said, it's a very controversial book. I already knew about it. And uh, I said, I know that. She said, you know, we're going to get a lot of flack from that book. I said, I know that too. And I said, but we're praying and we're believing that come May, when the booksellers, Christian booksellers convention was going to be, and it was going to be in Atlanta, that we were going to have the number one best-selling book. I had worked with the artists. Uh, back then, we didn't have Photoshop like we've got today. We actually had airbrush artists that did things like what Photoshop does today. And I was working this gentleman, his name is Bill Stevens, and I was working with him. He's an older gentleman, but I mean, he wanted to be just the best for this that he could possibly be. And we came out with this book, and <laughs> We got slammed by every publishing house. I don't know if you'll remember the book called Angels on Assignment, but it was the number one best-selling book. The first year we sold over five million copies of that book in the Christian world alone. That's like huge, huge. The following year, Billy Graham came out with a book on angels. We got more flack and I said, but you know what? How many people now who've given that book away because it talks about hope? It talks about the fact that God has our lives really in his hand, you know, like that song. He's got the whole world. He's got our lives planned, and those angels that he has commissioned around us work every day and night to make sure that God's plan is coming to fruition. It's coming. Acknowledge him in all that you do. Just take a moment, say, you know what? I don't know how it's gonna work out. I don't know how, why, when. I just know that without you, I'm sunk. And turn over all, turn, just, Turn it over. When Keith comes home with another box of decorations, just turn it over, Jay. <laughs> just, just turn it over and say, you get to put them up. You buy them, you put them up. Find a tree. When you can't figure it out, just acknowledge him. He will work on it. Just can't do it. <laughs> I know some people that, you know, and I have had these issues, and my kids would tell you he probably still does, control issues. I, you know, if I can't control it, then I don't want to be a part of it. I like, I, 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 I like the comfort zone of a house, Jeff's finding this out. <laughs> he, he found it out a long time ago. He's just now starting to give into it, though, that, that the house needs to stay clean. I said, we live here. We live here. You and I live here. And I said, so when the you half leaves your clothes around, this half doesn't enjoy that. And I said, so that's your job. I said, I just can't, I can't do that. I can't live in that house. I said, but if we're going to live here happily ever after, we want to do it in harmony. Yeah. So I remind him, God says, you can do all things. I don't care how tired you are when you come in. Why, why is Jose laughing at all this? I don't understand. I got two places. Believe me. And I bet I know which one's which. Okay. All that to say, you know, I don't want us having two places. His, his answer was, let's have two places. He, he said, it was so easy when I had my own place. I said, 
gal, but you were spending a lot of money on something that you were never at except occasionally. So God says you can do all things. Here in Philippians 4.13, he says, I can do what? All of this, whatever it is, I can. You can put that as a poster, Brian, and send it to him. I can do all this through Christ who gives me strength. I can do it. I can do it. I can keep that kitchen clean. I can. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can. All right. But I'm not able. I'm not able to do it. Yeah, yeah you can, because God says you're able. God says you're able. Over here in 2 Corinthians, says, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in almost everything, at almost all times, no, that in all things, in all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Every good work. You see, I think our congregation is so different in the fact that, you know what, we just believe God. We just believe God. It's not we come to worship God. No, we believe God. We, we come because we're celebrating the fact that we all have an understanding together that God will do what he says he will do. That's the good news. I don't have to worry about it. I just know that God will do what he says he will do. Sometimes people say, well, you know what? All that stuff, you know what? It's just not worth it. I'm glad God didn't say that. I'm, gl I'm glad God didn't say, you know, you know, Jessica, you're just not worth it. You know, we'll let Jesus die for everybody, but you're just not worth that. It's not. It's not even worth it. But God says it will be worth it. Look here. And we know, what? We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And we know that we already have a purpose in him. We just talked about that. God has a purpose for our life. And every day, every moment of that day, he has a plan. We can walk inside or we can walk outside of that plan. My goal is that, you know what? I want to know that every day, every moment of the day, my life gets more and more in tune with him. No matter what it is, I want to know that when he urges me to say something to this person or to that person, that it's not even going to be a question as to me as to why would I do that? Just to simply do it. I don't know of those of you who remember a, a, a man by the name of Smith Wigglesworth. He would do crazy things. When recorded, they were just outlandish, outlandish things. He leaned a guy up against the wall and socked him in the gut. Just plowed the man over, but the guy was healed. Today, that would probably end you up in a court case. But there were things about his life he would walk through. The anointing of God was so on him that he would walk through just a, uh, a factory. And people would fall over because of the presence of God was so strong on him. He would walk by and they would just collapse. Because he wanted to be so in the middle the fine line, that little line of the plan of God that God's anointing just stayed on him. Just stayed on him. This was one of his favorite scriptures. We know that in all things, all things, what if you could, not that we will, but what if you could walk through a hospital? What if you could walk through a hospice hospital where people, young people, like Philip deals with, children who are dying. What if you could just walk through? Because God said, I just want you to stop there. Just stop and pray just a moment and walk. Would we be conscious enough to do those things? Would, be a, would we be aware of it? And that's the thing, just learning to be sensitive to the presence of God. I just can't forgive myself. 
I talked with a young guy this week. He called, he called the church and he said, uh, you know, I know God is going to let me die. And I said, well, first off, God doesn't let you die. I said, because that's not it. Because if God's letting you die, you're going right to him. That's not how this works. And I explained to him about John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I said, God came that you might have life. And he said, uh, he'd, he'd done some really crazy things. And he, he said, I'm, I'm going to die as a result of this. And I said, first off, there's not a death sentence that God can't subvert. I said, so let's talk about it. But he said, I just can't forgive myself. I said, we're going to pray right now, and God is going to forgive you. God's going to forgive you. I said, and if he can forgive you, you need to learn to forgive yourself. Here it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This guy ended up in about 30 minutes. He was just crying because he just could not believe that God loved him. And I told him, I said, you know what? God loves you beyond your comprehension. You can't think about that because the love that we have oftentimes is so selfish. We love somebody because we want them. We want them to do something for us. We want to be with them. We have things that we tie to that. God's love for us has no ties, no strings. He just loves us because he does. Just because he does. I just can't manage it. Oh, here's the other one. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I told him, I said, you know what? You just need to move on past all of this because I said, God has forgiven you. And I said, what he's forgiven you, he took and he hurled into the deep blue sea, never to be remembered again. I said, so when the devil reminds you, just remind him, I don't know what you're talking about. And be like God, be like God. He laughed. I said, I said he said, I can't be like God. And I said, yeah, you can, you can be like God. Because he forgives. I don't know who's back there. They're at the back back door, I guess. Okay. Well, we say, I can't manage it. Can't manage it. God says he'll do what? Supply all your needs. Look here. Philippians 4.19. And my God will meet all of your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. The thing we got to remind ourselves is that when I can't manage it, when I can't pay for it, when I can't do this, I need to back up and say, well, did I move on that in foolishness, expecting God to do that? That would be like jumping off a building saying, I know that God's going to pick me up. I don't know that I want to do that. I just want to work in wisdom and knowledge and understanding like Kathy and I were talking about this morning about somebody. You have to count the cost count the cost. God has. He said, you know what? I will take care of you. I will help you. I will take care of all of your needs. Sometimes people say, well, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. But God says what? I have not given you a spirit of fear. I've not given you the spirit of fear. Here it is in 2 Timothy. It says, for the, for the spirit God gave us, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. I like the KJV on that one anyway. For the Spirit of God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of long, of the Spirit of Christ. Uh, worried and frustrated? Uh, maybe. I know that I, I get a little frustrated with our government. I know I get a little worried about the future, but you know what? I know that God's got all that control taken care of too. I just wish you'd let us all in on it a little sooner. But God says what? Cast all your cares on me. Cast all your cares on me. First Peter 5, 7. Cast all of your anxiety, your worry, your fear, your fret on him because he cares for you. He cares for you. He cares for you. Some people, you know, who are church people or have gone to church, They'll come in and they'll say, well, I just don't have enough faith. I just don't have enough faith to do this. 
Well, the good news is you don't have to because God's already given you all you'll need throughout every situation in life. You just need to use what you've got. And it says right here, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you, every one of us. The nice thing about it is we all start out with the same measure. We all get the same opportunity. I was listening to somebody, I forget who it was this week, was making a comment about evangelists and speakers and preachers who have you know, all these things, and they were talking about all these people, and, and they mentioned Ken Copeland, and I thought, you know what? You have no idea where Ken Copeland started. He started way back here. Every one of us in our walk with God starts small. And the more we believe, the more we believe. God gives us greater and greater faith for greater and greater things. He wants to see us exercise the faith that we have in him. So he puts those challenges in front of us that say, do we believe? And the answer is yes. The God that I serve can do anything. The only thing he can't do is build a rock big enough he can't lift. Every single thing that we walk through in our life God has already got the answer for. Already got the answer for. I'm not smart enough though. I'm not smart enough to figure all that out. Well, the good news is, God says, I'll give you wisdom. I'll give you wisdom. And here it says, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. I like it in KJV where it says, he has been made unto us wisdom. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. When Jesus Christ lives on the inside of you, you have the mind of Christ. That's all there is to it. We may not know how to figure out at that moment, but if you give God an opportunity, he will give you the revelation and the answer. The problem is most people try to do it in their own strength. That's why he says, don't lean on your own understanding. Don't lean on your own ability. And I guess this one, this final one, kind of touches a lot of our community right here. I feel all alone. And with the holidays coming up, I can understand that. You know, psychologists and bean counters out there tell us that more people commit suicide between Thanksgiving and Christmas than any other time throughout the whole year combined. Because they feel like they're without. So the scripture comes back and says, God says, I will never leave you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So when people are out there and they're saying they're just lonely, you know what? Can we do something to change that? Yeah, we can invite them. We can go do things with them. We can say, hey, listen, we're going to go. Let's pick up the phone, call a few people. Let's all go out to dinner. Let's all go out to lunch. Go out to hear Turtle Creek Corral. They're getting ready to go through all their Christmas season. There are other Christmas concerts that are out there that we can go to, that we can take people to. And if not in our community, there's lots out there. How many singing Christmas trees are there going to be here this year? I mean, lots of them. Go, enjoy them. Take someone with you. Because there are going to be people that don't have family, that don't have opportunities, that don't have what we share here with other people. Take them. It'll be good. It will be good. So let's take a moment. Let's pray this morning. Let's thank the Lord. You know what? We've got the solution to the 15 most common issues of life right now. We have the scripture that combats all of the bad negativity that's out there. We have those answers because God's word says, and that's the power that we believe in. So Heavenly Father, right now, this morning, Father, I thank you for it is your word that brings forth life and health and heals us inside out from the top of our head all the way down to the soles of our feet. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning that we receive life and health and benefit from your word this morning. Because Father, it's that life and health 
that we can share with each other because that's why you sent Jesus to this world so that we could be him to the world when he left. And here we are. The world is waiting for us to speak your words to them and bring life to them. So Heavenly Father, we give you the praise and the glory for it now this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.